this is going to be a little different tonight, obviously. Um, it's going to be more topical, um, and it's, it's not going to be exegetical per se, like my sermons usually are. Um, not, not, not that it's not going to exegete the word, it's just not going to be an exegesis over one passage. There's, we're going to be, there's going to be quite a bit of uh, scripture we're going through, um, and we're going to be talking about Jesus as the tabernacle. Now, a lot of this will be based on uh, what the youth and I are going through. Um, yeah, if you're, if, you're, if, they're, if you're looking at your notes, those are not the notes. Um, I, I'm not going to preach Pastor West's sermon. Um, I never could. Um, those are his thoughts. Those are his. Um, uh, he's way better than I am, so um, I'm not going to even try. Um, but this is something that the, the youth and I are going through on Wednesday nights, and um, it comes from a book. And this book is called Jesus Unmasked. And a lot of this, that's where, that's where it's going to come from. But it's basically, there, there are all these pictures in the Old Testament of Jesus. And there are some fairly obvious ones. Um, but there are some that, that aren't really that obvious. And so basically it's helping you to understand, and hopefully I will help you to understand, um, when you read the Old Testament, um, that everything, not everything, but every part of it is pointing to Christ. And when you read the Old Testament, and I've said this in my class a bunch of times, and I'll keep saying it until people will, you know, repeat it with me, but when you read the Old Testament, you have to read it with God keeping his promise in view. The whole context of the Old Testament is God is keeping his promise. That's it. And, and everything points to God keeping his promise. Okay, um, every, everything you read, it's God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. Even though the people are not um, keeping their end of the bargain, God will always keep his end of the bargain. And even though people will fail, they will every, t every time, um, God will not. And so the whole Old Testament is God keeps his promises. And so when you read anything in the Old Testament, keep that in the back of your mind continually that God keeps his promises. Okay, um, so... I thought about, I went through a bunch of these lessons this afternoon, and, and, I, and I thought, well, this one was the one that stood out the most to me. And, and I remember when I was a kid, my dad was really fixated on the tabernacle. And I don't really know why, um, maybe because it was very um, engineery, right? Um, the tabernacle had lots of specs, right? There's lots of specs and calculations in the Old Testament about, about how the tabernacle should be built how all the furniture should be built. And it was a specific way, and it was a specific height, and a specific width, and all a specific, specific material it had to be made out of, right? And, and that also is a picture of something, right? God is to be worshipped in a specific way. If we come to God and like, well, I'm going to worship God however I want to worship him, it's not going to work out. Um, God tells us, he shows us in the Old Testament, he shows us in the New Testament that this is how we come. This is how we come to worship. So the picture of the tabernacle is a picture of Christ. And I, I hope that I will help you to see this and maybe see some things that you haven't seen before. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try to go pretty broad and then I'll try to narrow it down. Um, so the Bible, obviously the Bible is, is divided into two testaments, two sections, right? You have the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you're like, okay, this is Sunday school, like one-on-one. -on -one. But what is a testament? A testament is just a writing down of a contract or a covenant um, between two parties, okay? Uh, the Old Testament records the Old Covenant. Uh, the New Testament records the New Covenant. Um, and so the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there are a number of covenants. Um, there's the uh, Noahic Covenant. There's the Abrahamic Covenant. There's the Davidic covenant, um, and, and mostly we're going to talk about tonight, and what people mostly think about, the old covenant is the Mosaic covenant. And the Mosaic covenant covers the Ten Commandments and all the law. So, and if you look at this covenant, um, it's a little different than the new covenant, because it's kind of a, a quid pro quo contract. And what I mean by that is... Um, it's between God and his people, and God says, listen, if you're obedient, I will bless you. If you are disobedient, I will curse you, right? So it's based on what they did. 
And, and you can look, if you later on uh, this, tonight, this evening, if you want to look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, you will see how he lays it out. Um, so, but unfortunately, the Jews were always unfaithful. They were always, they were persistently disobedient. And so when we, in our Sunday school classes, um, we are talking about coming back from the captivity, um, um, the Babylonian captivity. But even when they were taken into captivity, it was because God promised them that that would happen. He said, listen, do all this stuff. And if you don't do it, uh, you're going to be taken away. And so God is faithful to his promises. And even when he brings them back to the promised land, um, he is faithful. And he's, he is faithful to the Abrahamic covenant. And if you remember, the Abrahamic covenant was that there would be a land, a nation, and a seed. Right? That, that's the promises that he made to Abraham. And so all throughout the Old Testament, he's keeping up his promise of a land, a nation, and a seed. So even through that 2,000-year, some odd year history in the Old Testament of the, of the Jews and, and the nation of Israel, you see their rebellion and God's faithfulness. God punishes them. He restores them. But all of this was to make sure that his promise of a land, a nation, and a seed would be fulfilled. Okay? What about a covenant? If you think about covenant, you think about, uh, think about a contract. I know we have a lot of business people in here, and uh, I know part of my job in, uh, w- when I work um, during the week is I have to go over contracts, which I, I can't stand it. I don't like reading contracts, and that people always make this weird language. Um, but it's an agreement between two parties, right? When you sign a contract, it's an agreement between you and somebody else. It's a mutual agreement, and there are penalties if you don't hold up your end, Right? Um, if you think about the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, um, covenants were very similar to contracts now, but they were more personal, less legal. They were legally binding, but they were more personal. Um, covenants would bind two parties together in a very intimate way. It wasn't just business. It was, it was very serious and very intimate. And frequently the consequence of violating your covenant or your side was death. So it was very serious. It wasn't like, oh, well, you're going to pay a penalty and you have to pay this fee. No, you die. Okay, so it was a big deal. The purpose of the old covenant, what was the purpose? There was a lot of purposes for the Mosaic covenant. Uh, One of them was that if Israel would just obey God, he would bless them, and he would bless them so much that the people around them, the surrounding nations, would see that God was blessing them, and they would say, oh, like, I want to know who their God is, because their God is blessing them so much. Um, That only happened, like, a very small portion of the time. Um, Look at Exodus chapter 19, and verses 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So, again, we, we talked about that word peculiar before. Um, it's, he's saying that you're going to be my possession. You're going to be my special possession, my people, I, I, all the people of the, of the earth are mine, but you are the special people. That's what he's saying. So another thing, another reason was that the nation of Israel would be holy. They would be a set-apart nation out of which the seed, the Messiah, um, would be born. So if you go back to Genesis chapter 17, and this is the promise that God made to Abraham. Genesis 17 and verse 7. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Now, some people are confused. They're like, well, that, that's, he's talking about the seed of Abraham, like all the people, right? That's not what he's talking about. And in case you didn't know, uh, Paul kind of 
told the Galatians, if you go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, he's like, uh, well, this is what you thought, but this is not what it, this is what it is. He says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So he's saying, listen, the, the, how all nations are going to be blessed by your seed, it's not the Israelites, he's talking about Christ. And that's what Jews would do. They're like, oh, well, they always want to go back to Father Abraham, right? Because that's what they thought. Well, that wasn't it. It was Christ was the promised seed. So the next, the next reason that, or the next purpose of the Old Covenant um, was that the Jews would feel the weight of the law. Um, and, and they would call out to God and ask him to deliver them and to forgive them. And, and that, still, that still is the same for us, right? If you go back to Galatians where we just were and, and skip down to verse 24, <clears throat> Paul says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the law becomes a tutor. The law becomes something that leads us to Christ. The, the law shows you where you're deficient. The law will show you what you need, and that is a savior because you cannot do it. <clears throat> and so another thing the Old Covenant provided was a sacrificial system for the atonement of sins. Now, this was only a covering. This was not a removal of sin. And so we'll go to Hebrews chapter 10, and this is where we'll kind of stay. We'll stay in Hebrews for a while. Um, but Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1, says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering of what is not, but a body hast thou prepared for me, or prepared me, sorry. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come into the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are of offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So, Jesus came to do away with the first covenant and establish the second. Okay, that's literally what Hebrews says. Now, I'll go into Hebrews a little bit more later, but I want you to see the centerpiece of worship. The centerpiece of the covenant was the tabernacle. That was the centerpiece. Um, it was a traveling tent. Um, it went, the Jews would take it with them wherever they went. They would carry that thing, and when God said, okay, stop here, they would set it all up, and they would, they would camp around it, and they had to camp a certain way, and it had to always, the gate had to always face the east. So they were constantly moving it and putting it up and taking it down. Now, later when they get into the promised land, the, the tabernacle gets replaced by the temple, okay? But the priests still had to perform their duties, um, especially uh, the blood sacrifices. They did it every day. And then one day a year on the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, God's special presence or his Shekinah glory would come and it would fall on the Holy of Holies. Now, let me give you a Hebrew lesson because I know you're like, I don't know uh, Shekinah. That sounds a little weird. Um, what does that mean? So let me give you a, a, just a short Hebrew lesson. And according to Strong's Concordance, the Old Testament Hebrew word for tabernacle or tent is mishkan. The prefix is mish, and the root is can, which means, mish means the place where something happens, can means to dwell. So when you put those two words together, you get mishkan, or the place where God dwells. 
okay? Um, the tabernacle was the place where God would dwell with his people. And then his special presence would come once a year. That's his Shekinah glory, okay? Notice Shekinah, S-H-K-N, just like Mishkan. God's Shekinah glory, his special presence, would come um, on the Day of Atonement. Now, what about Greek? I, know I can't just leave you with Hebrew. I've got to give you some Greek too, okay? Um, but I don't normally do this. I, I just want you to see this. Um, the, the Greek word for tabernacle is skene. Okay, if you look at tabernacle, Shekinah, Skene, they all have S-K-N. They all have the same root. Okay, um, Jesus is the tabernacle. If you look at John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word dwelt among us, where it says dwelt, the word for dwelt is skene. So it literally says that Jesus came and tabernacled among us. Jesus came and pitched his tent with us. This is a clear reference to the Old Testament. It's a clear reference to the tabernacle. Um, and God's Shekinah glory came in Jesus, and he tabernacled with us. So the Old Testament tabernacle is obviously a picture of Christ. Hopefully you guys see that. And Hebrews makes this clear. And if you ever have a chance to read Hebrews, I, I seriously urge you to do it. Because we're, we're doing all this study in the Old Testament. And you go and you read through Hebrews, and Hebrews will say, this is what that meant, and this is what that meant, and this is what that meant, and this is what that meant. And you understand, you're like, oh, now I understand why all that was in there. Um, and the theme, of, the theme of Hebrews is Jesus is better. Right? Jesus is better than angels. Jesus is a better covenant. He brings a better covenant. Jesus is a better tabernacle. Jesus is a better everything. So if you look at the Old Testament tabernacle, and the tent itself is just a shadow, it's a type of Jesus. But I don't know if you think about every piece of furniture in the tabernacle is a picture of Christ. All right, go to um, Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll read verses 1 through 5. It says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. So, all of these pieces of furniture are a picture of Christ. Now, I'm going to go through them one at a time, and I, I won't take that long. I know all of you, I, I saw a scared look on some of your faces, but I'm not, I'm not going to take that long. So um, if you have a picture of the temple, okay, so that's just an artist, an artist rendering because they didn't have cameras back then, but that's what they would do. They would set it up. The Israelites would camp uh, according to their tribes um, around the tabernacle. Um, they would set up, oh, where is that? They would set up uh, this gate that would face the east always, and then you had the outer court, and then that was the tabernacle itself. Um, show me the, uh, the schematic of the temple, Gabe. <clears throat> so here, you would see, here's the gate, and this is the outer court. All of this is the outer court right here. Uh, there's where the burnt offerings are offered. There's the laver. There's the door going into the tabernacle, the table of showbread, the golden candlestick, the altar of incense. And then that was called the holy place. There was a veil. And then here is the most holy place or the holy of holies. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. So just to kind of give you a picture of what we're talking about. So if you look at the entrance to the outer courtyard, the children of Israel had to go through the door, which always faced east in the outer courtyard. Christ is the door. Look at John chapter 10, verse 7. 
John chapter 10, verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He shall go in and out and find pasture. So even the door is a picture of Christ. Now what about the laver? The laver <clears throat> was a wash basin that priests would use to ceremonially wash their hands and their feet before they went into the, the holy place. And if, if they tried to go in the holy place with dirty hands or dirty feet, guess what? They died. Okay? Christ is a picture of the laver. Or the laver is a picture of Christ, I'm sorry. John chapter 13 and verse 8. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. We all have to be washed by the word, right? We all have to be washed before we can enter in, just like the priests were. Now, the golden lampstand, that was a seven, uh, everybody has seen them, uh, like a menorah, right? A seven branch candlestick. Um, that was in the tabernacle. It burned olive oil. It was the only light. It, you remember the picture that you saw? There wasn't any windows. They didn't have stained glass windows in the tabernacle. Um, there were no windows, so there was no light. The only light came from that lampstand. So if you go uh, to John chapter 8 and, and verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So without the candle, the priest would have to walk in darkness. There was no light. Only the candle gave light. Now what about the table of showbread? This was a table just as you to the right as you entered in uh, to the holy place. And it, there were 12 loaves of bread, and each, each loaf represented one of the tribes of Israel, right? But Christ is that bread. John 6.35 says, sorry, I thought I had it. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He's the bread. What about the altar of incense? Now, there was an altar there that they burnt incense on and the fragrance of that incense would waft through the camp and it would go um, through the holy of holies and go on over the mercy seat and in the old testament incense when they burnt incense that was a picture of prayer right there's a picture of intercession just as your prayers rise up to god the incense would rise up the smoke would rise up right um and an interesting thing is is the thing that heated the altar of incense, they got the coals from the altar of sacrifice. So they had coals that the blood of the lambs had spilled on. They would take those coals from the, the sacrifice altar and they would use it to light the altar of incense. It was holy. But Christ is also that altar. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Just as the altar of incense, the incense was always burning. There was always intercession being made. Christ is always interceding for us. So he is the altar of incense. Now, what about the veil? The veil was a really thick curtain, and it was made of blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen that was twined together, and no priest could go through the Holy of Holies, into the Holy of Holies, unless they went through the veil. And if he passed through the veil without being clean, what happened? He died, right? Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. He is the veil. We have to pass through him to get to God. Now, what about the Ark of the Covenant? 
Everybody knows what this is look like. Everybody knows what this looks like because everybody's seen Indiana Jones. You know, it's a gold, it's a gold box and it has some angels on the top of it, right? But the, on the top the, the, was the mercy seat, and that's where the angels' wings would touch. And um, it contained the, the, the Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments. It contained a pot of manna. It contained Aaron's rod that budded. But every year on the Day of Atonement, a blood of a goat would be sprinkled on the mercy seat, and God would come down and hover over it. And, and this, this blood would be to just to cover the sins of the people. That's it, just to cover them. And God would be there, um, and his glory would come down, and he would offer a covering or a propitiation for the people. Okay? Christ is that mercy seat. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. He's the mercy seat. He, he gives us the propitiation. He covers our sins. And not only does he cover them, he takes them away. Now, what about the priests? There are priests. The priest was the mediator between God and man, right? Um, people would bring stuff to the priest, and the priest would take it. The, the people would bring their sacrifice, and the priest would make it, and he would make the sacrifice for the people. Christ is the high priest. So go back to Hebrews chapter 7. And look at verse 26. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He was the highest of the high priests. He was the ultimate high priest. Later in, in uh, Hebrews, it says that he was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That means his, his uh, priesthood never started and it never ended. It never will end. Now, what about the sacrifice? Every year, they would take an unblemished lamb and he would be slaughtered for the covering of the sins of an individual. And the priest would take his hand and he would put um, his hand on the, on the head of that lamb and he would slit its throat. But he would symbolically transfer um, the sins of that individual to that lamb. But that was only for the covering. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10 again. It says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. One time. So if you look at all the furniture, if you, if you pull up a, a schematic, and I'm not going to pull it up again, but if you look at that furniture, something's missing. There's something missing out of that furniture. Day after day, year after year, the priests would enter, they would go in and out of the tabernacle, they would offer sacrifice, they stood on their feet hour after hour, they never sat down because their work was never done. There wasn't a chair there, no chair, right? Look at Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to go 11 through 14. We'll finish up um, what we just read. <clears throat> It says, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So Jesus sat down. Why did he sat down? Because his work was done. The work was done. No more need for any more sacrifices. It's over. When he said it is finished on the cross, not only was our debt paid in full, but the work was finished. Done. He sat down. The priest never could sat down. They never could sat down because their work was never done. Christ said, listen, it's done. It's finished. So he rested from his labor. He's done. But what about now? 
what, how does, where does God tabernacle now? A lot of people, are, you know, we, we talk about the, the church and, and, and how that works. And well, where, where is God now? Um, if you go to John chapter 16 and verse 7, John is talking to the disciples, or Jesus is talking to the disciples, excuse me. Um, and he says in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For I, if I go not away, the comfort, Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So Jesus promised, promised that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, his helper, would come. The third person of the Trinity is coming. And for those who will repent and believe in Christ, God now dwells in us. We are the tabernacle. And because God's Holy Spirit tabernacles in his people... Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, he says, What, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, that you have of God, and you're not your own? You were bought with a price. So, if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives, he dwells in you. God tabernacles with you. Go to Romans chapter 8. Verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So if you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He is going to quicken you. He's going to make you alive. He's going to make you understand the things of God. If you are not a Christian, God is not dwelling in you. Look at go backwards just a couple of verses in Romans chapter 8, um, starting in verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then that they, are, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So if you're not a Christian, God's not dwelling in you. God is not your friend. He's your enemy. Now, the Word will tell you that we're all children of God. We're not. Now, in one sense, we are because God created everything, and there's nothing made without Him making it. But in the other sense, we're, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You're either a children of God or you're a children of the devil. Um, go back just a couple of chapters in Romans chapter 5. And this is where we're going to... We're almost finished. Romans chapter 5, starting verse 8. It says, God, But God commended his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son... Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who, by whom we have now received the atonement. And that's the atonement that takes away sin. And this is what makes grace so amazing. God doesn't just save sinless people. He doesn't just save the good people. He saves the wretched people. He saves the disgusting people. He saves his enemies if you're in Christ, God's not your enemy anymore. But if you are not, you are still his enemy. And you're still under control of the devil. You are the devil's children. And if you reject God's grace, if you reject his gift of amazing grace, and it is amazing, the, the last words, some of the last words of Hebrews are for you. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, who hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite into the Spirit of grace. For we know him that saith, Vengeance belongeth to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Why would you want that? 
why would you want to be in the hands of a living God? Why would you want to fall into his hands for judgment? You don't have to be on the receiving end of his wrath. You don't. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to be separated from God forever. You don't have to endure all the punishment. But if you don't, if you reject him, the punishment you get is not, it's not un, unwarranted. The Bible says if you're going to trample underfoot the gospel, if you're going to trample underfoot the blood of Christ, then you deserve what you get. And hell is going to be worse for people who have heard the gospel and said no than to people who have never heard it. So don't, don't reject grace. Don't reject what God has given us, what God has provided. Um, you have to put your faith and trust in Christ, his, the perfect sacrifice. You have to repent and be reconciled to God.